Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the CHI Speaker Series. I hope the new year is treating everybody well. And to kick off this new year, we have Dr. Russell Greiner here back again. Um, his last presentation was back in October. So if you didn't have the privilege of coming to view that, I'll do a little bit of a reintroduction. Today, he will be presenting on an effective way to estimate an individual's survival distribution. Uh, he is a professor in the Department of Computing Sciences at the University of Alberta. He is also the founding scientific director and now a PI at the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. Uh, Dr. Greiner, you can take it from there. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing your screens. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, patient-specific survival prediction, or more precisely, an effective way to estimate an individual's survival distribution. This is joint work with a host of characters, a former postdoc, uh, two former master's students, some other programmers and designers, as well as many users from major faculties in, in medicine. Um, <clears throat> so let me start by a question um, that was posed to me by some liver uh, specialists. Said, Here's a patient with end-stage liver, liver failure. Should this patient be waitlisted for a new liver? And the, the answer was yes, they should waitlist this person, and this person would benefit. If there's like a 95% chance of surviving at least three months and 85% chance of living at five years, maybe some other constraints. Otherwise, it wouldn't be worth providing that liver to this person, maybe another person would be better qualified. <clears throat> so to do this, we need to estimate its probabilities, the chance of surviving at least t, you know, time t for this patient for many different time points. So <clears throat> how do you go about producing a model that does that? So let me talk about standard models of survival prediction and survival analysis. So <clears throat> to start the phase, let me begin with a horrible question. Suppose you just learned your potential failed disease. What would be the first question you would ask? And again, as more as participation, I would get several responses. I'm going to anticipate what you might be saying. <clears throat> what can I do to reduce my risk to live longer? What's the probability I'll survive at least 10 years? Of people with this disease, <clears throat> tell me more about them. What is there? Hence my chance of living at least three months, at least one year, at least five years. Or maybe the question, the question most people will say is, <clears throat> how long do I have to live? What's my personal survival distribution? So lots of questions that people might pose at this point. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it turns out there are tools which do each one of these. One of them is with the context of survival predictions, understanding risk. This gives a number, 3.2, 7.4, 1.5, numbers which give some idea of who will die first? High risk is bad. You know, I don't want to have high risk if you could if, if you get to choose, right? So <clears throat> there are tools like this tool for disease risk index, uh, a tool for lung cancer, for example, that asks 10 questions. And after 10 questions, gives you your risk score. It gives you a number, red, green, orange, blue. Um, and it says this is the lowest risk you might have. So it's got nice colors. <clears throat> and it says, you know, your current risk is there. If you were to do other things, you reduce your risk. It tends to probably potentially, potentially live longer, but it's not clear what it means. <clears throat> How much longer? Is this another 30 years if I change this? Another two weeks? What does it really mean to have a lower risk in terms of something quantifiable? So <clears throat> it's nice to have this to know you could do better by changing by some changes, but it's better having some calibrator values. So what does that mean? <clears throat> Same, same sort of data. You might say for this patient, this is a probability of 10 year survival. And I'd rather live, I'd rather have a higher chance of living 10 years. Higher survival probability is good. And there are tools which do this. <clears throat> if you might know the Framingham study for cardiovascular disease, there's tools that are based on this. There's websites you can go to. And they ask you seven questions. And after that, give a 10 year survival. And for this particular person, there was a 22.9% chance of a 10-year survival. That's great. I care about 10 years. But what about my one-year survival? Why not 20 years? <clears throat> Why just one year? Well, are there other things I can do? So maybe I'm going to look at multiple time points. 
So there's survival curves. So imagine I take the population, and I have different large subsets of the population, uh, males with box score of four or females with box score of two. <clears throat> and I can get the survival curves of these individuals. So the tools which do it also. The SEER study has data sets which you can put in some information about yourself and come back with a, a, a statistic. So this is a survival curve. <clears throat> this is a curve that says, for example, um, 50%, I'm sorry, uh, there's 11% chance of surviving, 11% um, chance of surviving five years. You get other statistics. There's a 7% chance of only 10 years. And the median survival, I didn't write down here, is a little under one year. So that's really great. That gives lots of different time points, which is wonderful. But it, it's only for this huge class of people people with lung and bronchus cancers who are 65 years old and male. <clears throat> but it doesn't use any patient, anything more patient specific. Nothing about histology or blood work, nothing about, about genetic information or about other, other comorbidities. So that was nice. <clears throat> so back to the questions I posed earlier, there are tools which do all these things. There are tools which determine risk scores. I showed you the one of those. One does a one-time survival prediction for this individual, and one that gives population-based survival curves, but for a population. The question most people, when I pose a question to audiences in general, the question most people ask is, how long do I have to live? Not, not all the people like me. What's my personal survival distribution for which I can get some estimates? So the game here would be <clears throat> you know, same set of people. I want an individual survival curve. And they'll say, for this person, it's a curve like that. For this person, it's a curve like that. For this person, a curve like this. And we can now do statistics from this. For example, the mean value of the curve, that is the expected survival time. This person is 2.1 years. This person is 3.5. This person is 8.7. I'd rather be this. I'd rather be this middle person if I got to choose. <clears throat> so we built curves to do that. I'm going to describe one in a few minutes. but. To give a context, I can talk about stage four survival, stage four cancer. So if I have two different people, both the stage four cancer, they both would have the same curve if I use with the population. But now I tell you about 30 other features, about certain blood factors and so forth. And now I get very different curves. So for, for this patient, um, again, I, have, I didn't show the population curve, but um, the population would say, um, there is a 11 month survival. This patient, uh, Mr. 1314, I think would live twice as long. Whereas unfortunately, Ms. 1523 would only live about a fifth as long based on these other factors. I'm going to describe a tool which can do these, this thing, can produce individual survival curve and talk about why it's calibrated and why it gives good answers for an individual. <clears throat> so here's the outline of my talk. I motivated the context of what the game, what game we're playing. I'm now going to say a little bit about survival analysis 101. What is survival analysis? Why is it different than standard regression? Certain standard models like Kappa Meyer and Cox, <clears throat> as well as some other nuances. And that will lead to this particular tool, multitasking just regression. I'll describe how to evaluate a whole different model for evaluation, as well as some empirical studies and some discussion. Now, at this point, I'd like to try to ask these people I can see, how many people here are very familiar with survival analysis or epidemiologists? Anyone? Let's see a few hands. <clears throat> a thumb up, okay. So again, uh, this will be, some of this would be very repetitive because I should, these are things you know, but I'm going to assume that I'll start from the very beginning and give some sort of fact, initial things. So um, you can tune up for a little bit. Nothing here will be new for the first part of it. I get the, the I'll tune you back in and get to some of the new models. Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> Survival Analysis 101. Oh, and one more comment. <clears throat> While the focus and all the terminology be time to death, this really is time to an event happens. That event could be good. It could be time to remission of a disease or time to relapse, which is bad, or, or time to re-injury. And it doesn't have to be medical. You can have a mechanical system. How long until a part fails? or how long until you get a promotion, or this whole field of customer churn, 
how long until someone stops going back to Safeway or someone leaves my company? These are things. My favorite example, I'm a, I'm a professor, a students graduate. How long until they actually graduate? That's an event that I can look for in the horizon. It's time to an event. And these are different types of events to consider. Okay, <clears throat> off we go. Here's the starting point. We have a survival data set. We describe every row as a different patient, every column is a factor, and there's a time. And so what do you do with some such data? One thing lots of models do, and lots of bioinformatics and biostatistician and epidemiology is finding risk factors, finding a feature which by itself increases risk. You know, so high BMI increases your risk of disease or being not protects you, reduces the risk. So they look at this data and they find individual factors which are important in some sense. That's one game. The game I am playing is building a regressor, trying to predict this time for an individual. <clears throat> so machine learning 101 is full of different regression techniques, producing the, the price of a house, given factors about a neighborhood, or a, or a certain um, blood factor, you know, a certain rent value I would get based on certain characteristics of a patient, all well and good. This problem is different. Survival data is different because the data set looks like a standard survival thing with a bunch of, of independent covariates and a dependent outcome. There's also, you know, there's also this other thing. There's also one more thing. There's a sensor bit, a bit that says whether the numbers I give you are the right numbers or an underestimate. What does that mean? <clears throat> Imagine a study started in 1990 and five years later that study ended. So we recruit patients, some patients, that's a little angel rising, some patients died in the course of the study. That happens. So these are one class of patients. There are other patients, patient three, who started at the beginning five years later, was still going strong, he left the study. The study was over, there's no more follow-up. And uh, uh, we know we have five years, so that's all we know about this patient. Here's a patient with the proverbial, you know, I'm trying to look at who dies of breast cancer, and this patient got hit by a truck. Didn't, she didn't die of breast cancer, but we know that, you know, for 3.9 years, whatever it was, she was still alive. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the first set of patients are uncensored. We know what happened to them. We know how long they lived. <clears throat> these, these other patients, sorry, are called right censored. We know they lived at least five years, at least 3.9 years, whatever, at least 2.1 years. So we know something about them, but how long they actually lived, we don't know, and we never will. So this is the standard model, right? So 3.1 and 2.2, this goes at five years and so forth. And there's a sensor bit, which for reasons lost to time, the, the description is backwards, but a sensor bit being one means they, they were uncensored and sensor being zero means they were censored. So <clears throat> the sensor, means the time of death is, um, even I did it backwards, I'm sorry. Uh, if censored is one, oh, that means, oh, I did it right, it's time of death equals that. If censored equals zero, that means time of death is a lower bound. It's a lower bound, so it's not meaningless. We can't just ignore it. <clears throat> I just want to point out that when I first started looking at survival prediction, I figured there'd be, you know, a thousand individuals and five are censored, I'll throw them out. No. Many data sets, most data sets have like 70% censored. I can't throw away 70% of the data. So I need to do something clever with this information. So what can we do with it? So one idea is survival functions. I already showed that earlier. <clears throat> That's every value, S of, so T is time, S of T, the high here, is a probability of living, of living at least T. That's what percentage of patients survive longer than T months? So here it's one minus the cumulative distribution function. Here I'd say there's a 50% chance of surviving at least 12 months. That's what this graph is showing. And there's a very famous model, a Kaplan-Meier model, that estimates survival curves for a population. It's a piecewise constant curve. So <clears throat> and it's often used to compare populations, male versus female, or drug versus placebo. So just to track people, um, if you got to choose, would you take the placebo or a drug? Show of hands, who would take the drug here? And who would take the placebo? Yeah, okay, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, uh, 
Uh, I, I didn't see that, Elliot. I didn't see. Uh, so clearly, <clears throat> this is saying which we do, and there's tests. There's a, there's a log rank test of statistics saying, do I believe it's statistically different? And you can use it to get, make decisions. Uh, male is better than being female. Let me reword that. Uh, female is better than being male, perhaps. Taking the placebo, the drug did not help. In fact, it hurt. It was a log rank statistic difference, but it finds risk factors. It's a very valuable tool to this community. <clears throat> um, again, so it's used for a single factor. It can answer questions about a factor, not about a patient. <clears throat> and he looks at this curve and says, um, I'm, I remember that I'm a member of this curve, so that describes me is fooling themselves. It's sort of an average population. It doesn't mean it works for an individual, which is an overarching factor. It doesn't have other factors. It doesn't have other features. But that's what survival curves are. Some called the hazard function, which is another representation <clears throat> that's instantaneous rate of death. Imagine you live six months. What's the chance of dying the next instant? And here, this curve, again, it's a different curve. I should use a different symbol for it, I realize. Uh, oh no, this is a survival curve, I'm sorry. The derivative of this divided by some other quantities is a hazard, hazard rate. So six months after surgery, you're very likely to die. 24 months is lower to die. Again, and there's tools like the, uh, uh, the Cox proportional hazard model. I'm gonna skip that for reason of time, but it should, if, if you had the hazard function, you can get the survival function by exponentiating the negative integral of it. But I'm gonna skip a few more slides about this. <clears throat> there's a lot of tools. There's risk assessment tools like Cox proportional hazard and regularized versions and survival force and so forth. There's also quantitative scores that just give a single number, which gives you some risk assessments. There's also single time probability. I mentioned Framingham, this Gale model. And so there's a tool built by some colleagues sitting here who did the predict depression model that gave a five year score. And there's other like accelerated failure time and sensors to SVM. Lots of different tools are around. But let me try to contrast two different classes of models. There's one set of tools which are designed for epidemiologists to try to find risk factors, trying to find prognostic factors or treatment efficacies for a population. You evaluate with respect to a population, and it's good for new drugs or new devices. Great tools, Kaplan-Meier, Cox feature selection applied to this. Another set of tools, the tools I'm interested in developing here are tools that do individual patient-specific survival for risk or for probabilities. You look at individuals and assess them by individual or pairs of individual assessments. And they're good for saying, Mr. Smith, take this treatment or how to manage individual patients. There's other tools for that as well. <clears throat> so back to the task I started with, I want to know if a particular patient should get a procedure, should be waitlisted for a liver transplant or get an expensive drug. And I'm told again, I need to have these criteria. So I need to estimate these quantities. And now I can, I, I describe some existing tools. Do they work? So, <clears throat> so for example, risk assessment tools that say this guy's risk is 19, this guy's risk is four. Important tools, but that doesn't answer my question. It just gives a real number. It gives a, it, I need a probability, not a score. I need chances for having three years, not a score of five, uh, this is a point nine, uh, 92 for the risk score. That doesn't help. And it should vary over time, not a single time independent score. So standard risk assessment is not a good idea. That's not for our task here. What about these group multiple time probabilities? Map everyone to a certain chance of surviving. That's good for, th for three months and for five years and for 10 years, but, but that's the whole population. I want to know for an individual, for this person, should this person be weightless or not? So that's not the right model either. <clears throat> what about these single time predictors? I could say the chance of surviving three months and build one model for that, a model for building five years, another model for that. You could do that, <clears throat> but you might need multiple time models for different time points. And there's another more subtle problem. Imagine one model, so the chance of living one year is zero, and the chance of living three years is 30%. Who thinks this is a good idea? What, if you die after one year, what's the chance you're gonna be alive in two years? I think we should have a no zombie rule. 
you're dead, you stay dead. <clears throat> These things should be monotonic, they have to decrease. Whereas if you just build arbitrary models, you might get funny. I like that, it's a funny, you might get funny things happen. So we don't want that way either. We also want to have a multiple set of times. We may want to have other times. I said three months and five years, but maybe I care about 10 years also, maybe one year as well. So <clears throat> I may want to see what it looks like to visualize it. So let's rule out these ones as well. So we need a different model. So what model should we use here? I've already suggested a patient-specific curve. For every patient, I get a curve. So for this patient, <clears throat> this patient, I can look at three months, look at five years ago, one year as well. And yeah, 90, yeah, it was 95% after after three months, more than 85% after six months. Yeah, this got good. What about this patient? Well, passed the first test, but not this one. Nope, it's gotta be both tests. No, this, this patient just didn't pass either test. Survival curves are a good idea. And the tool we're gonna provide, I can build a curve for every individual. Look at the individual and make estimates and say who should be included and who should not. <clears throat> Let me back up a little bit and say, we started looking at survival models. I got confused because Lots of papers say similar words, and I realize there are different things going on. Again, for the epidemiologists who have looked at these models, let me talk about some of the distinctions. There's a bunch of survival analysis systems that produce a power probability, and some do risk scores. So, and then for the probabilities and risk both, they might do a single value. What's the chance of dying? That's a question. Or maybe what's the chance of dying at one year, at two years, at three years? So there's different ways to do, so it's one time, multiple times, one time that applies to a particular, so it might be a five year, it might be for all time. So it's different models, different time points, as well as probability and risk. And there are tools to do all these. One other dimension is, oh, sorry, is whether it's for an individual or for a group. So again, to populate, though this would say, um, a uh, gives a probability, not a risk, has multiple time points, not just one point for a time or one point for all times, as for a group. And this one, you know, so this one is risk. Well, let me actually just jump in and say, there's things like Framingham study that gave five-year probability of, of success uh, for an individual, as opposed to SEER models, which were sort of Kaplan-Meier-esque, which looked at a population, which was a probability there were multiple time points for a group, or the the disease risk index and so forth for different places. And the things I'll be talking about are individual survival curves at this point. There are probabilities, not risks. There are multiple time points and they're individuated, not for groups. Okay. <clears throat> so how would you evaluate this model? So once I've said all those things, I can talk about, uh, if you look at any, any paper on survival analysis, they say, let's evaluate by concordance, by C index. And again, I'll give the details later on, but right now that's very helpful for risk, that's designed for risk scores. That's, that's very helpful uh, for, for the, this risk thing, especially for individual risk predictors um, for a single time point. That's where it lives. Uh, and this one as well could be applied. Um, <clears throat> so it says, I give, two, I give Mr. A, a score, there should be a score. Whoever gets a higher score, I think he dies first. If so, you get a point. Well, again, that's not what I wanted. I want to get probabilities, and that doesn't apply. Forget that one. <clears throat> um, there's also tools that do calibration, and I'll say what that means at the moment later on, but basically it says, if I tell you there's a one year, an 80% chance of, of an 80% chance of surviving one year, then if I have 10 people, I say that too, I expect eight of them to live that long. That's great for one time point, but I have multiple time points, so it doesn't work out either. So I need a new, a new evaluation also. So again, back to this game over here, I wanna be able to have confidence to say, if I see 95% chance of dying, I wanna believe that. And 85% chance of five, I wanna believe that also. How do we do that? So I gave you two questions. How do I build an individual survival model and how do I evaluate it? I'm about to answer those questions now. We're going to talk about multitask logistic regression, MTLR. It's going to learn, I'm going to talk about how it works and how, and then, then talk about this evaluation measure. Other questions so far?
Okay, I keep going. So <clears throat> survival, uh, the survival model is a chance of living at least time time t. I can do a probability mass function, I can a survival function which is a chance of living exactly time t. So this is a chance of, of dying at any given point, and this gives a curve. Um, I'm going to desk, and so I'm going to say the chance of living at least four months is going to be the integral of that. It's the whole area of the curve. That's the chance of, of dying at four, four by one, four by two. So it's that curve. So now I'm going to actually discretize it. Uh, I'm going to look at a sort of probability distribution function, I'm going to probability mass function. I'm going to chunk it into, for example, every two years. And so what's the chance of dying in this interval or that interval or that interval? And now I can talk about the chance of dying, of, of living at least four years is just the sum of these two chunks. That's the chance of, of living you know, at least four years means I lived in this interval or that interval. So uh, that would be the, the score. So the whole game here is I'm going to discretize into intervals. They don't have to be of constant time. And now I'm going to say chance of 4.5 is just the sum of all ones beyond that. So it's a discretization process. Once I do that, I can talk about the chance of dying in an interval. I can say the probability of dying there is D3, D4, and D5. So now I can use that to just observe that if you die at the last interval, you must have been alive in the earlier intervals. So I can, this is a, this is a proof by PowerPoint. You can now just, just I'm just gonna do a little animation here. So this is just saying the survival curve, the chance of living at least as long is just basically the, the integral adding them up the wrong way. That's, that's why the, uh, the survival curve is one minus the CDF, the cumulative distribution function. So I take these chunks, I then smooth it, and I, I then just, I get a survival curve. So that's a basic algorithm. <clears throat> the the multitask of just regression basically learns the just regression function for each one of these. And then, and then adds them up the wrong way. And there's a lot of little details. Again, I'll skip most of the math. Just saying, I do something a little bit different. I actually, uh, it's not quite logistic function. It's a little more complicated. I do a little bit of additions in the exponent. Um, yada, 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 I do something there. <clears throat> I, then, I then do a partition function. People know, people know um, uh, the standard um, Markov random fields. You know, the, the partition function is complicated because I got to add a bunch of things. Here I'd add up just a small number of them. Um, so I just, just M terms rather than doing them with those M different time points. And I get the actual, the, PD, the, the PMF is going to be just these problems. These are the chunks I looked at earlier. How do I learn this? Again, <clears throat> I, I basically try to optimize the log likelihood. I'll skip the details, the likelihood term, and a, and a regularization term. It's convex and differentiable. I initialize by doing uncensored data, I use EM. I try to find C2 by cross validation, turn cross validation. If that made sense, great. If not, don't worry about it. There's an algorithm you can buy, you can download and play with. And we use like square root of M time points. So the game now is here's a, here's a patient. <clears throat> we have a learned model that then builds a survival curve for this individual. I get this model by starting with a novel patient with the sensor bit, and I have an MTLR learner for that. Some of the benefits, <clears throat> it handles sensor data very naturally. It's a probabilistic model, which means if I know someone lived to the second interval, that person I might have died. There's only three different ways of, that might have happened. Either the person died at this interval, so they died at time three and the third interval, or they were alive in the third and died in the fourth, or they lived to the very end. Just three numbers, and I can just compute this by marginalizing. So it's a very simple marginalization to do it. So it handles censoring very naturally. There's this, I already mentioned a very simple estimation algorithm for computing the values. <clears throat> it has some other nice properties. The median survival time, it just went across this 50%. That's true for survival curve in general. Um, I can do confidence intervals. There's a 50% chance the person lived between 20 and 71 months. So there's a lot of things I can do with this type of model. <clears throat> I also can look at the, the mean time. And again, another proof, proof by a, um, what is, 
the mean time is the chance of probability of dying in each interval time, that interval time. And again, I'll skip the details, just say it's exactly the integral, which is really cute, and it's easy to just add them up, add them up weighted by the, by the distance here. So let's cut what's it doing it. Another benefit, again, I didn't talk about Cox, the Cox model. You can build a Cox model, which actually gives a curve, but it separates the interval with the curve. Oh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going a bit faster. Uh, just saying that if you use Cox with the Prentice, with the Cubus Prentice estimator, you get different curves at different time points. Here, the curves are just, they actually integrate both patient properties and time. Okay, so let me now jump and say, that's our model. Do you believe it works? How would you evaluate a survival curve model? <clears throat> so here's what we get. We get this mishmash of stuff. <clears throat> Lots of curves, each for a patient. Do you believe it? How, why, how can I convince you you should use it? Could you trust it? If you tell a patient something, what would the patient want to believe you? So let me talk about how you would evaluate a survival curve. And let me make, take the simple curve. Suppose you have one curve, capital model gives one curve for the whole population. How would you evaluate this? I claim this is a, this is a capital model curve that was based on a population. Do you believe it? Well, <clears throat> so for example, this says every patient has the same curve. So I would say, for example, what is the median of this population? Well, the median here across 50 probability at 20 months. So I'd say medians 20 months. So any patient who died before that has a, has a higher Kaplan-Meier probability and the patient after that have a lower one. So suppose I now give you 100 patients in the same population and let's ignore sensing for a moment. How, if I did it right, of these 100 patients, how many should die before 20 months? Any guesses? All of them, none of them. If this curve is right, if, I, if the curve says half the people die before 20 months, then that means half should die before 20 months. 50 should die before, uh, 50 should die before, and 50 should die after. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> so basically the set of patients whose time of death is less than the median should be about 50 or in general, the percentage of patients who died should be 50%. And there's nothing special about half. 75% should live at least eight months and 25% at least 52 months. That's what it means. That's what it's supposed to mean. So for any probability, for any probability, I expect the number of people who live at least the probability of the death time being greater than rho, that should be row percentage, right? Okay, let me keep going. So now, <clears throat> I've, so now I've got this mess. It's not just one curve, it's a bunch of curves. What does it mean? Well, every patient has his or her own one. So for patient R1, uh, his median time, his 50% was 3.1, 32 here, 74 there. Okay, so now what do I do? Let me ask the same question. I have 100 patients from the same population. How many should die before their respected median times? Any ideas? The correct answer is half. <clears throat> if I did it right, 50% should die. So out of these, out of these 100 patients, 50, some should die before the median times, some should die after. If I do it right, half should die before, half should die after. So it's again, the same sort of formula the number of patients who died before their, their individual median time, R sub i, should be half. And again, to compare the formula, it's just here there's different distributions for different patients run the same one, but the same formula. And the same idea, right? So this should be uniformly distributed over zero one if I do it right. Okay, <clears throat> running out of time. So I want a distribution model that does it. Um, you know, I'm going to go a bit faster. So if I do it right, um, if I would expect, say, this patient uh, who actually died here, it should be there. This patient who died here, that's in the in this quadrile, and so forth. So if I did it right, these four patients, they should each die. You know, one patient each quadrile. 
let's say, a sideways histogram. Now, in our case, we've, that'd be one patient who died here would be at this percentile at this uh, 20 terms. And if I have 2,402 patients, we expect to look like this, and this should all be about 5%. I'm skipping, skipping, skipping. It's just there's only five percent. Use five for cost validation. Um, we actually use a chi-square test, and we find that it actually did pass the test. What about censored patients? We blur them out over a, over the over the patients over the remaining probability. There's a simple formula by using independencies here. Um, good. So I gave you a model to evaluate them. Did it work? So maybe a little bit faster. So again, I'm going to look at just context where we look at multiple prob probability values from multiple time points, I'm going to include Kaplan-Meier because it makes it, it gives some interesting observations as well as other models. Okay, and so there's multitask of just regression, accelerated failure time with a Weeble match. You can use Cox with the Cambridge Prentice way to compute the actual curve. You can regularize it to avoid overfitting. There's a random survival forest model, which has Kaplan-Meier at the endpoints. I think as Kaplan-Meier itself. So we tried six different models, and they look like this. There's one Kaplan-Meier, accelerated failure time, and Cox. Um, they basically are all the same curves, just sort of scaled up a little bit. Um, if you use the, um, the regularization, it's a little bit smoother. There's RSF and MTLR, and they can cross because they do different things. We then try to we in fact, 85 public data sets we played with. We wanted we choose eight of them for a variety um, that had between <clears throat> 170 to 2,400 different subjects, which had censoring from 17% to 86%, which had 12 features to 7,000 features. We then did some, some pre-processing, and we ended up going from the six to six to uh, uh, 2330 three, features. So a wide variety of different things. How do these different models compare? Uh, we talked about three classes. There are some nice ones, which had a fairly small number of features, for instance, and had relatively low censoring rates. Ones with high censoring, ones with high dimensions. So lots of details, just for variety. <clears throat> we then tried decalibration. How did that work? Some didn't convert. MTLR, lo and behold, it, Numbers greater than 0 0.5 means it did not fail the test. It means we can believe it was calibrated. <clears throat> so we believe all eight of them were calibrated, which is great. Uh, turns out Kaplan Myers decalibrated also. In fact, we can prove we, in our paper, we, we proved that uh, asymptotically is decalibrated. Um, but it's not individualized, so you can't use individual predictions. But decalibration seems like a good idea in general. Uh, other models did seven or five out of eight, but nothing did as well as eight. <clears throat> um, I would argue that uh, a tool which is uh, for individual anytime models, if it's not decalibrated, if it is decalibrated, you can say, if I say 85% chance of dying after five years, that means if I say that, if I look at a bunch of patients, 85% did in fact live at least that number. That's why decalibration is so important for this task. And other models which weren't decalibrated, I would say, can we believe them? I, I wouldn't believe I'm 85% sure after five years. <clears throat> other models, again, uh, I think I'm gonna skip some of these, but you want individual because it gives personalized decisions. You want any time point because you want to make making decisions at different points. You want calibrated to believe these predictions. Um, oh my, okay. Uh, there's other models, there's concordance, one calibration and L1 loss. Go very quickly. How do people know concordance? How do people know A1C? It turns out the same thing. Um, it's just looking at, at the chance of inversions. And again, I'm running out of time. So let me just say it's sort of the number of times that the predicted event happens. So ignoring the censoring, here you'd say that, for example, uh, uh, back here for patient one. So these are the MELB scores. This is a the order in which people died. And it turns out um, one did die before two, just as we predicted. One did not die before three, so, so that was not predicted. And one in four did the right thing, and one in five did the right thing. And then for number patient two, same thing. We see he died before four and five, but not before three. 
um, and so forth. So we can get these things and find it. Seven to 10 times it was correct and there's issue with censoring, but okay. So how do MTLRI work? If we use the negative of the mean value, how does it work? Well, turns out it, it was the best it worked. It was a top six out of eight times and never very far from the top. <clears throat> One calibration, this is the weatherman problem. The weatherman says every day, he says 60% chance of, sorry, every day he gives a probability. Five times he said 60% chance of rain tomorrow. What does that mean? Well, that means out of five times, he got, it doesn't mean this, it means out of the five times, it actually rained three of those five times, that's 60%. That's what calibration, one calibration means. And so we can do the same thing here for like 30 months and play lots of games. And you want, you know, take the average of these numbers, it's 78, and actually four of the five died, that's 80%. Whether it would be similar, you can play this game and you can just look at, it. we can then use the, um, uh, the Hosmer 11 saw test or just visualize to see how well it works. Once again, we can see how often we're calibrated at different quantiles. And, and we did a really good job, uh, whereas the other tools had to do as well. I'm going to skip Ellen Loss. A lot of interesting questions here. Um, <clears throat> so if you have a problem, oh, I'm going to get the five minute warning. Uh, <clears throat> you can talk about, is there a low centering or high centering? What's the dimensionality? And we can talk about what tools work best and based on the analysis we did for calibration and discrimination. Looks like m is a pretty good tool to use for most of them. And it's not bad here either, just the other tools are just as good and much simpler. And we built it for the for the who to wait this question. We actually have a tool that you can go to and download and, and play and, and decide which of these patients, based on the recipient information, option based on donor information, who should be waitlisted. And lots of stuff there. Um, okay, now let's skip this. I'm going to just jump to the end right now. So lots of interesting questions here. I'm going to skip them all. Go to conclusion. We have a website. You can upload your data and play with it get pretty pictures and get statistics out of it. Um, you can also, there's a GitHub repository, which is our code you can play with as well. I wanna acknowledge all the wonderful people who helped me out on this task. <coughs> um, the, the liver transplant people, uh, Vicky Barakos, who looks at, who looks at um, uh, end stage uh, survival. She's an oncologist um, who does wonderful work in the context of, uh, of end of life decisions as well as breast cancer and other people have helped uh, contributions. So I motivated this idea of individual survival distributions, a general approach for survival prediction, which does most of the tasks I mentioned. It does risk and does one calibration as well as give us this curves. I introduced a new way to evaluate it called decalibration. <clears throat> I then described a particular individual survival distribution model and multi-task distribution regression. It's probabilistic, which means Handling sensor data is easy and allows time, I didn't show you time varying effects of different features. And we demonstrated it works effectively versus other models, these websites and code repositories. And I'll ask for questions and I'll use Stephen Wright's quote, intend to live forever, so far so good. Oh, one more thing. If anyone's really interested in survival prediction, there's a workshop, a, symp a, a, a symposium coming up um, that was supposed to be at Stanford, but it's gonna be online and uh, it'll be a few months from now. So if you're interested in that, let me know, it's on my webpage. And I'll stop you. Questions? Wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. For more information on who we are and what we offer, visit our website at coming.ucalgary.ca forward slash CHI. If you are interested in our services, collaborating with our team, or have any other inquiries, contact us via email at chi at ucalgary.ca.